Good morning, Saints. We want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving week and have it and make it safe. Glorify the Lord through it all. Tell somebody about the Lord this week. Please stand as we worship our Lord and Savior this morning.
Father, that is such good news. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your grace, Lord, Lord God. Again, open our hearts, open our eyes, and open our ears to feel you about our lives, Father, each and every moment of the day, Lord God. Be with us today. Bless our service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and good morning. It is a much fuller congregation than it was when I was first up here. Wow. Everybody all right? <laughs> Amen. Take your Bibles. Open to Ephesians chapter 3. That's Ephesians chapter 3. Today, the Lord willing, we're going to be looking at the value of of your Christian faith, the value of your faith personally. Let's open in one more prayer. God, as everybody in the congregation is opening your word to just the right spot there in Ephesians chapter 3, God, we pray you open us in just the right spots of our hearts and our lives to hear it and to apply it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read verses 1 through the middle of verse 3 to start with. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13, Lord willing, in this uh, message today. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. The whole message is going to hinge on that statement. I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me, to you were. That is the grace, the special grace God gave him toward the Gentile believers, and especially the church of Ephesus. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. I love the Greek word for mystery, and throughout the New Testament it's used a, a few times because there are things that are made known in the New Testament that were never known throughout the world before. And the word is mysterion. <laughs> the mystery. And when we're talking about the mystery here in Ephesians, we're not talking about the mystery of iniquity. We're not talking about some mystery novel. We're talking about the greatest mystery of all. The mystery of Christ. Paul says, if you've heard of the dispensation, that is, the particular age and covenant and relationship that we're in with God, if you've heard of the dispensation and the grace which was given to me, to you. <laughs> That's pretty interesting wording there. And it talks about the revelation of the mystery that Paul possessed. What you need to see in these few verses is that Paul was a prisoner because of the special revelation he possessed concerning Christ and the church. Paul was imprisoned because of his unique understanding of this revelation. We're going to talk about, in a little bit, what made Paul's understanding so unique. But what you need to know right now is, Paul's in prison as he writes this letter because false brethren within the church, that is, those who could not perceive where God was going with this thing. And so... 
His unique position towards the work of Christ had put him at odds with even the church itself. And it caused some to betray him to adversary authorities. It almost makes me think about what took place under the three self church in communist China. And how many of the saints and pastors and godly leaders there in China who had no connection to the outside world, only the faith that they held in their own unique context were turned over to the government and denounced by their own church members. And a similar situation happened to Paul when he went back to Jerusalem and he carried Gentile believers with him and some of the pious church members at the first church of Jerusalem decided they didn't want that kind in their congregation and so they took the opportunity to turn Paul over to the Jewish authorities. He's in the temple with Gentiles! Get him! And Paul's sitting in prison writing a letter to the Gentile believers and he says, maybe you've heard of the special grace that God had gave me to you. <laughs> wow. Now, understand, Paul's in prison because he possessed a very special revelation. Let's explain, explore it a little further. In the good old King James, in the middle of verse 3, it says, As I wrote to you, a four and few words. I know that many of the modern translations, they, they're uncomfortable with the fact that Paul wrote other letters that, that were not in the Bible. But God did not see fit to put them in the Bible. <laughs> so, if you see in some of the modern translations, it tries to make that say that this, eliminate this reference to another epistle. I believe there's at least twice we see Paul making reference to other writings that he made. And that doesn't mean that they had to be Bible or that we're missing something in our Bible. Paul was a prolific writer. I'm certain that he had many letters that went out that were not exactly God-breathed. And were not chosen by God to be in the holy canon of Scripture. Now, don't get choked on that. But he says, I wrote to you before, and that letter would help you understand my position and my unique calling. Verse 4. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So, I wrote to you before. If you read it, you'd understand my particular knowledge concerning the mystery of Christ. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The revelation is in verse 6 that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the Gospel. This is a unique revelation. It's not that the other apostles did not have this revelation. In fact, all the apostles possessed this knowledge. But the Apostle Paul pursued it to its fullest end. That is, it's one thing to hold an idea, or a belief, or a conviction. It's another thing to be absolutely compelled by it. God made known to the Apostle Peter by un no uncertain terms that he was taking the Gospel to the Gentiles also 
when he sent him to a man by the name of Cornelius. Some call that the Pentecost of the Gentiles. And God took the gospel message to that Italian commander there, that captain, if you would. And the Spirit of God was given to the Gentiles on that event. And so, from that moment on, the church had to recognize that God was calling all peoples, every ethnos, to faith in Jesus Christ and that the promise of the Spirit, which was the sealing of the deal of all the promises of God, that that was being bestowed upon those non-Jewish peoples who believed in Jesus also. Wow. But it's one thing to know that. It's another thing to be driven by it. In these early days, the apostles from Jerusalem, they're not quite being driven by the Great Commission that said, go into all the world. Every nation. Now, Paul is. And that makes him a pioneer in his time, in his generation. In fact, Paul began to plow the way, and even though he was the latter apostle, the others began to follow his paths. <laughs> Paul pioneered the way, and the others followed behind him and got on board and said, you know what, this is the right way of God. But it's interesting to, to know that, to understand that. The apostles were all part of the revelation. But Paul's insight to the mystery was unique to his calling. I want to give you a reference in 2 Peter. And here's the, Rarely do we hear one apostle reference another one. But here the apostle Peter, who is the first preacher of the gospel at Pentecost, who is Petra, the rock. He is considered by some to be the, the rock that the church is built upon. I'm glad that our church is built on a greater rock than Peter. <laughs> it's built on the foundation of faith in Jesus Christ, who is the solid rock. But Peter is a rock belonging to the rock, and he said these words about the Apostle Paul in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. And accounting that long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, speaking of the end of times, even as our beloved brother Paul. <laughs> also, according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do all the other scriptures unto their own destruction. And here the apostle Peter speaking in reference to the Apostle Paul and his writings to the church, testifies that these writings are indeed holy scriptures inspired by God, comparing him to the prophets of old. This is the same Peter. And this is written long after the event, but this is the same Peter that one day, when they're all having a big old fellowship meal at the Gentile church, and some of those good pious folks from Jerusalem showed up, Peter's sitting there eating and enjoying the company, decides, oh, they're going to see me sitting at the table here with these non-circumcised folks, and then I'm going to be in trouble back in Jerusalem. 
and he gets up and he, just to save face, he moves to another table. The same Peter, the apostle Paul, rebuked in front of everybody. Peter, what are you doing? Have you forgotten the revelation that we hold? That the Gentiles too are partakers of the promises through the mystery of the gospel of Christ? Well, I bet Peter wasn't happy about that that day. But years later, as he writes about him, he says the wisdom that God has given him. Paul possessed a special wisdom that was unique to his calling. And that was a calling. That was a calling that had been divinely revealed to Paul. When we talk about revelation, we're talking about spiritual enlightenment. If you look at the bottom of verse 5, speaking to the apostles, it says, As it is now revealed unto His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And that's capital S. It's important to understand that the Bible, the Old Testament, and the New Testament alike, and the revelation of Christ contained in the Scriptures, that it is divinely inspired by the Spirit of God. And the prophets of old and the apostles of new, they possess the same divine authority because their message came from the same source. Now, just a few themes I want you to notice in that passage. One, the word revelation. Two, the word promise. And three, the gospel. It is the gospel message that makes available the promises of God in Christ. Let's move on. In verses 7 through the first part of verse 9, Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Oh, friends, the Apostle Paul exercised divine power by the gift of grace that God had bestowed upon him to go about his mission. And it was a mission that all men would see the mystery. A mystery is something that's hidden. It's something that you scratch your head, you don't know about. You're ignorant to it. The whole idea is something that is not seen. And Paul's mission was to make this mystery about the church and about the work of Christ. His mission was to make it seen. It was not known beforehand. It was not understood beforehand. As God began to open the apostles' hearts and eyes to understand and to see, they were hesitant to walk into it. But God called this one man Paul, and his very purpose for existence and living was to make the mystery that had been hidden seen 
by all men. And in giving them a chance to see, they had a chance to believe or to reject. But at least they got to see. Hmm. Wow. If you notice the thing about the effectual working of God's power, that was... God enacting His gift of grace in Paul. I want to chase a rabbit for a minute. Paul's sermon. We're not moving forward. I'm, I want to hit this point. Free of charge, if you would. <laughs> the gifts of Christ... The gifts that God has given through Jesus to the church. Spiritual gifts. They are gifts of grace. Let me explain something. They are not natural talents. Everybody comes into the world with talents that God bestows on all humanity. But we make a dear mistake if we believe that our natural talents and inclinations are spiritual gifts, because spiritual gifts can only be exercised by divine power. Too often we go about the work of the Lord and our natural abilities and wondering why we're getting little results. But God... When we go about His mission, utilizing the grace and the gift of grace He's given to each of us, God empowers it. And consequently, natural abilities and gifts, they can be spiritual gifts once they've been to the cross. <laughs> Old brother Peter had a gift of gab. He was all the time running his mouth, even boldly. But boy, it wasn't until after the cross that God took that gift that was broken in him and he began to empower it, resurrected it, turned it into something he could use for his glory. You may have gifts you've been wanting to use for God, you've been trying to use for God, and you've been accomplishing very little, even in your own esteem. And God's saying, put it to the cross. Die to your pride in it. Die to what you think you can accomplish in your own ability and potential and surrender it to me. Let me resurrect it. Let me impart my spirit power to it. Let me pour out my grace on it. And you use it then to my glory. To my mission in your life. To make all men see the mystery. <laughs> and then you'll be empowered. Whew. Oh, friends. It's easy to preach that to y'all, but there's a many a time I preached a sermon just utilizing what I felt like was my natural ability to run my mouth. Done it a many a time, unfortunately. But I'm learning more and more. I can do nothing on my own. But Christ's power, and the power of the Spirit, it accomplishes everything. Let's read on. <clears throat> That was free of charge. That was not the sermon. We see the themes in this passage. The theme of grace. The theme of divine power. We talk, see about the riches of Christ. The fellowship of the mystery. Beautiful, beautiful imagery in those words. And we're sharing in this Move and work of God. 
that all men that see it and believe it can have a part in it? Wow. I love a good fellowship. It's unfortunate that we've not been able to enjoy our fellowships as we have in the past around here. But I tell you, whether we break bread or not, we've got a fellowship right now amongst each other. We're in unity. We're in agreement as we join together believing the words of God and the testimony of Christ. We share in the mystery. We're a part of it. Now, here's where it begins to get really good. And I'm going to tell you, the church, as I studied this, I begin to get overwhelmed. I mean, some things are deeper than my little peon mind. <laughs> you know, and you go to diving in this, and, and you go to scratching your head, and whoa, I tell you, you can get lost. But it's good, wonderful stuff, and I want to keep it simple as we move through these next few verses. But this is where it really jumps in. So he talks about to make all men to see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And that mystery, it says, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> it's interesting that Paul was making the mystery known to all men. That is, everyone that received the mystery became a part of the fellowship. He's making it known to the church. Their part in the mystery. But the church makes known to the angelic powers <laughs> the divine wisdom of God in the mystery of Christ. Bear with me for a minute. If you go over to Revelation, and even in many of the visions of the prophets, you read about cherub, you read about seraphim, you read about the living creatures in Revelations that had multiple eyes surrounding their bodies, and when we try to describe them, they seem like hideous monsters, but they are very real and very alive. In fact, they were created of old by God for a unique and particular purpose. These are heavenly beings. These are angelic powers. And they have eyes surrounding their entire bodies because they are built and designed and created for the purpose to watch God in His infinite work throughout the ages and for time past, they have watched and waited and witnessed the work and activities of God expecting an end. And the Apostle Paul uses the word now by the church through the church in the church now they see the manifold wisdom of God. <laughs> God used the apostle to reveal the mystery of Christ to the world, but God is using the church to reveal His manifold wisdom to those angelic beings that have watched and waited for eons. The church is at the very center of God's eternal purposes. Don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget it. Now, whew, that's good stuff.
they couldn't see what God was doing. I remember being on jobs and work sites. And the skill of the people that I was working with was so great. I couldn't see the end that they were working to. I had a rude and, and, and ignorant way of going about the same task. And I would, I, would, I would say, what are you doing? And I would question and I'd, I'd ponder and I'd think, hey, these guys, he, he's not even accomplishing anything. Where's he going with this? And what else is he doing over there with that math? <laughs> Who needs math anyway? They're over there. I got my tape measure, you know, doing my math. And then, when they bring all their work together, how masterful, how accurate, how correct, and how ignorant I'd be standing there and thinking, Duh. how'd they do that? They look like wizards in my eyes because of the skill they possessed. It seems so beyond me. Oh, those angelic beings who have watched for so long and now they see a culmination in the work of God in the mystery of Christ as He brings together all people to faith in Jesus and brings them into one body, the church, and all they can do is stand there with all their big eyes open. <laughs> Wide taking in and wonder the wisdom of God. <clears throat> In verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. There is a confident access to God available through the faith that's in Jesus. He has provided in Himself through His atoning death at the cross and through the power of His glorious resurrection, Jesus Christ has provided in Himself a living way to God. And the Apostle Paul reminds the church that now you have access to God and not only a little bit of access through symbols and types, but you have a bold confidence ability to approach the living, mighty, eternal God because Christ has made you a way. And through your faith in Him, you can approach God confidently. Consequently, how is your prayer life? <laughs> Do you approach God not expecting? Do you approach God not feeling welcome? Do you approach God thinking that maybe He's up there not listening? Are you timid? Are you intrepid? Do you feel the weight of your shortcomings and your sins and faults and setbacks? When you try to come into His presence, I tell you, friends, if you come by any other means but the faith in Him who has become the way, you're going to feel all that and more. But if you come through that sacred holy faith to God Almighty, you can come with a confidence. Not in your own righteousness. Not in your own abilities. Not in your own accomplishments. But in the way that Christ has provided. <laughs> the door's wide open to you. Now. Whew. He says that confidence is important. Christ has made you a way. You don't have to be timid about your relationship with God. You don't have to feel like you're, you don't belong. You don't have to approach God from a distance anymore. You can go right up 
into His presence through the work of Christ. This access, this is what the gospel is all about. This is why Christ died. This is why He rose again. To give you the ability to come to a holy God when you in your own right had no business to be there. Even by your own ethnicity were excluded. And Christ has become your access pass to God. More than that, your living way. Wow. Paul's telling the Ephesians this because it's important to them at this time frame in their history as a church. I want to conclude with verse 13. Paul says, Wherefore, because of this access that the gospel has provided you and this bold confidence you can have with God because of all this that I've been explaining about the mystery. Wherefore, this is Paul's desire for the Ephesian church, but it's his desire for you and I as well. I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Let me unpack that for a minute. We started out with the statement that Paul was imprisoned for the Gentiles. At this time frame, many of the other apostles were at large. Many of the other apostles were footloose and fancy free. Not only the apostles, but many false preachers and And many wannabe apostles and evangelists are running around and Paul's locked up. And so, he carrying that message that belongs so intricately and intimately to the Gentile church at Ephesus. Him being locked up, they begin to feel a little bit discouraged. Now there's all these other people running around telling us we're not quite as good as Christians because of our ethnicity, because of our background, because of our history as those with the pedigree there at Jerusalem. They were starting to feel a little scared because what if Paul's fate become their fate? What if imprisonment And tribulations would be their lot if they continued to follow this particular way that Paul has brought to them. And Paul said, you're looking at it wrong, friends. He explains to them how important the church is in the purposes of God. And then he begins to explain his situation personally. His imprisonment for their sakes and for the sake of their faith was not something to cause discouragement in the congregation, but rather a sense of honor. That their faith was important enough for Him to be willing to suffer for them. He wouldn't have been in prison had he not had that unique calling to bring the gospel to other peoples. And they were the other peoples. Paul was in prison for the Gentile church. Their faith was so vitally important to Paul Because it was of vital importance in the purposes of God that Paul himself was willing to face whatever tribulation he had to face to ensure their faith could stand. Paul said, you got the wrong result from my imprisonment. 
you got discouraged. My imprisonment for your sake should be not a discouragement, but a something that causes you to feel divine honor and worth. <laughs> I wonder how many saints throughout the ages have had to suffer troubles, imprisonments, persecution from outsiders, persecution from political powers, persecution from false brethren. I wonder throughout the ages, world without end, how many saints have suffered to entrust the faith to you and I. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if we really see the significance. I wonder. If you and I today. As Christians. Living in the privileges. Living in the benefits of a Christian society living in the abundance of access to Bible and church and God, I wonder if we truly perceive just how important the church is in the eternal purposes of God. Oh, if we did, friends, we wouldn't take it for granted. <laughs> if you know how vitally precious your faith in Christ is in the purposes of God, then it would be most sacred to you and I. It would be at the forefront of who we are. In fact, if you understood how important your faith is in God's divine plan your faith in Christ would be the very thing from which you drew your purpose and your identity because that would be that which was most important in your personhood I'm afraid that today, and I ain't pointing fingers, I can point them right back at myself. I'm afraid that today, too often our faith is secondary to who we are. We seek our value from outside sources. People's approval, accomplishments in our lives, our financial positions, our comfort. And all the while, we're sacrificing our true value. <laughs> We're denying our real worth. <laughs> We're telling the world that what we possess as vessels of the treasure of the divine, that it's just secondary to natural things. And I tell you, friend, the world has got the message and picked up on it and ran with it. And they don't think nothing of kicking dirt on our sacred faith. And they say, after all, it wasn't so sacred to you anyway when you lived just like us. Wow. Friends, I ain't here to put nobody down or to discourage you. What I want you to understand is We've been looking to the wrong sources concerning our value and our purpose. We've been looking to worldly things that perish, that amount to nothing, and trying to draw from them some type of identity in our personhood. And all along, the very thing that gives us eternal value, we've not discarded it. We just treated it like it was a little less than the things of the world. And I tell you, 
we've made a grave mistake. The Bible says we possess this treasure in earthen vessels. We're to, we're to clay pots. This world and this life and this existence and all the things of it, it's just made of earth stuff. But the treasure of Christ that you and I possessed of the mystery of the gospel, that we house the Spirit of God, that's the thing that gives us eternal value as individuals. And until we get our priorities right, don't expect the world to treat your faith with anything but content. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to stand. As they sing, we join them in worshiping God together. I want to ask you this. From what do you draw value for your personhood? Oh, it's easy to say I draw value from my Christian faith. But it's another thing to look at the evidence of our lives and say what do we pursue with all our passions what are we after what are we trying to accomplish for ourselves what's our mission in the world what is the thing that constantly we go after and I tell you friends what we'll find is oftentimes we're looking in the wrong directions for personal value and work when all along we possess the divine treasure of Christ. It's time that you and I as believers it's time we recognize our true identities as children of God. You say the world is against us. They're supposed to be. When we're living for Christ, Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, then the world is going to hate you because they first hated you. He said again in another place, if you're going to be my disciple, you can expect persecution. In fact, you're going to have to learn to say that you love less even the word despise or hate those that you hold so precious and dear. Those that are closest. Because they're not going to understand why you value me, Jesus, more than anything else. And when you don't live according to the world's values, you're going to pay for it. That's a fact. The problem is we've been living according to the world's values so long, we never really expected to pay a price for our true values. I'm going to ask you this morning to look deep into the heart to allow the Spirit of God to speak to you and to ask yourself with a resounding honesty within the depths of your soul what is my core convictions? Where do I find my value and purpose? Friends, if the Spirit of God tells you you've been looking in other directions than the treasure of Christ, this is the time to get it right. Because you're going to need some confidence with God in the days ahead. As we sing, and God speaks to your heart. The water so my soul longed after Thee. You alone are my heart's desire.
church. Amen. 